Well, thank you. I wanted to thank Arnaud for the invitation, second year in a row, uh, and I'm very excited to be here, and I wanted to give him a very grateful thank you. Uh, and then I realized that he scheduled me right after the most popular and famous television personality in Mexico. So, Arno, what are you doing to me? You're killing me today. It's very, but really, that was, that was great. That was great. I hope we can measure up here. So, my name is Joe Varengia, CSR Director for Arrow Electronics. And just briefly, has anyone here ever heard of Arrow Electronics? Anybody? One, two, three, okay. Well, you guys don't count. You guys don't count. So, we are one of those large, global, multinational companies that do everything that you've never heard of, but we have touched your life 50 times today, okay, 50 times. So Arrow Electronics, $24 billion US a year in revenue, 19,000 employees, we are in 90 countries in 450 locations in that country, including three in Mexico, and we're growing in Mexico. It's one reason why we're here today. Uh, but no one had ever heard of us. So five years ago, our CEO said, if we want to grow from $24 billion a year to $50 billion a year, we need a new identity. We need a brand identity because all we do now is a lot of work for our customers, which is great, but that won't get us to the next level. So we embarked on a brand mission, and that was all around innovation, okay? So our, our brand message now is we guide innovators to a better tomorrow. And our tagline under our Arrow logo, here's the logo down there, Arrow, our tagline is five years out. So what does that mean, five years out? Five years is the tangible horizon for technology. Five years ago, you didn't have a Fitbit, and you might not have had some sort of smart electronics on your bicycle. Five years from now, you're gonna have something else, and we're working with those innovation companies now to develop it. And now, instead of just providing the components that are inside all electronics, we provide the design support, engineering. Uh, we, still do the, we still do the components. We also do the contract manufacturing. So, for example, when you buy to the, go to the store and you buy something from HP, but they have laid off 60,000 people in the past couple of years, you wonder, how could I possibly buy something from HP? Well, that's because we do it for them now, because they've outsourced much of that to us. So that entire innovation process is now something that we do by contract for others. But that's still not enough of an identity. We needed projects that would allow people to understand what we do, even if they're not in electronics. And that's why we came up with the idea of the SAM car. SAM, S-A-M, stands for semi, I should know this, right? It's my car. Semi-autonomous motor car. It's not like the Google car, which drives you around itself. This car still has a driver. And we wanted to keep the driver in the car because we believe that driving is a command process it's, it's part of innovation and in that we do not want to take the human out of the innovation process. That innovation should work for human beings. Technology should be in the service of people, not the other way around. And we think that's a powerful concept. And so we came up with the idea of this car, a semi-autonomous motor car, and because our CEO loves racing, we wanted it a fast car. So we have, have a Corvette. And then we got the idea, in order to make a really big splash, we need to introduce it at the biggest race in the world, the Indy 500, which is the single largest sporting event for one day a year in the world. 450,000 people, 450,000 spectators. But we still needed someone to drive the car. We had never met Sam Schmidt before we had this idea. We had never even heard of Sam Schmidt and he had never heard of us. So we had an intermediary send him a text after we had the idea, 
And he said, Sam, would you drive the car? And he said, if you build it, I'll drive it. He answered our text in five seconds, even though he had never heard of us before. And then 10 seconds later, I got another text, and it said, if you're not interested in going at least 100 miles an hour, don't call me again. And that's when we knew we had our man, because we wanted to go fast, too. The interesting thing about Sam, and really the definition of this project, is Sam is a quadriplegic. He has no movement from his shoulders down after a racing crash in 2000 that broke his neck. He lived, but he's been paralyzed now for 17 years. Within a year after his accident, he switched from being a driver to a racing team owner. He also has a nonprofit, and he's the director of Braun Mobility, which is one of the world's largest companies for converting vehicles for, the, for driving by paraplegics. But quadriplegic driving is a whole new field. And in 2014, we bought the car and we modified the car, the original Sam car, so Sam could drive it. And you see up here in the, in the top, there's a, a variety of different modifications that go together to form one seamless application for quadriplegic driving. So, how does it work? In the first year, we called it Sam 1.0, and we call it driving with your head. Infrared cameras track his head motion, so when he turns his head left, the car goes left. When he turns it right, the car goes right. For acceleration, he would tilt his head back, and for braking, he would bite down on a plate in his mouth. It was good enough to work. It was good enough to drive 100 miles an hour, but it wasn't good enough. And one of the reasons was that acceleration. Every time he put his head back, he could drive 10 miles an hour faster. So acceleration was not like how you and I accelerate, where we put our foot to the floor and the car goes. It was very incremental. And we had to do laps around the racetrack in order to gather speed. Still, at the Indy 500, we did two warm-up laps and then four laps, treating him as a qualifying race car driver. We knew he wouldn't qualify for the race, but it was a measure of respect. And he was able to do four laps, first at 97 miles an hour, and then next time, the next day, he went out and he went 107 miles an hour. So that's a success. We're done, right? No. Sam 2.0. And our goal was that we wanted to add maneuverability, steering with the speed. And that meant we wanted to drive on road courses and street courses. Steering is still left to right with your head, but with much more sensitive cameras. And for acceleration and braking, we went to standard sip and puff technology, a tube in his mouth with a pressure sensor, so he blows in to go faster, and he sucks back on the tube to go slower. And this enabled us to drive road courses, which as you can see from this model, have a very snake-like road course, including 180 degree hairpin turns. We first did this at the Long Beach uh, Grand Prix in Long Beach, California, April 2015, where we did 180 degree hairpin turns. The one thing that held us back was not SAM or the technology. There were other cars on the track with able-bodied drivers who were going slower than he would, and they stopped us. We were too good, even though he could only drive with his head. So what about 2016, the, la the year that we just finished? Well, we had some very specific goals for 2016 that went beyond road courses and went beyond just driving on the oval track. And for that, we needed to go to steer-by-wire technology. And that means that we are using electronics to bypass the existing steering. We still have the steering wheel in the car, so you can see it go around even though he can't touch it. But, but the steer-by-wire, just with electronics, bypasses the normal steering system and goes straight to the wheels, the same way straight to the throttle and straight to the brakes. Much more, much more precise. It all also allows for improved remote capability. Um, 
We also added voice commands, so now there are 50 programmable functions in the car that allow Sam greater control over the car just by speaking. He'll say things like, door open, and we can open the door, which allows him better access into the car. Window up, window down. Gear shift, shift to drive, shift to reverse, ignition start, ignition stop. He does that all with his voice now. And we're able to customize all this for him. And so what did we do? Well, we went back to Indy, this time 152 miles an hour. 100 was nice, 150 is a lot better. And I'll tell you what that did for him, Sam, as a person. It made him feel as a relevant person on the racetrack again. The actual IndyCar drivers now are going 235 miles an hour, but by going 150, he got the attention and the respect of today's drivers. We also uh, embarked on the 100th anniversary Pikes Peak International Hill Climb, which I will show you in a minute. The hardest thing we have attempted, it's not just a racetrack, it's a race up a mountain over 12 miles, 156 turns, 4,000 feet in elevation gain to the summit of a 14,000 foot mountain. Sam did this race in 15 minutes with a top speed of 80 miles an hour. But we weren't done. We got him a driver's license. Sam is now legal to drive on the streets in America with an experimental car with a restricted driver's license. First of its kind in the world, and that is why Business Insider named us the top car innovation for the world in 2016. Not the Google car, not all those other automated cars, the Sam car. And with that, to really give you the flavor of what the Sam car is all about, let's show the video. That's a big impact for Sam Schmidt there. Considered the very real fear that he would never be in the driver's seat ever again. Until I was paralyzed, literally everything in my life I could conquer with just, you know, perseverance and determination. Paralysis is the first thing that I, I haven't been able to, you know, figure out how to fix. Before this, there was nothing available for quadriplegics to be able to control a vehicle period. We took what existed for paraplegics and retrofitted our own control system on top of it. You know, the first round was trying to get Sam from point A to B. Can that even be done? Sam Schmidt, 14 years and four months after being paralyzed in an Indy car crash, he drove a car again. It was an emotional day for all of us involved in this sport. An oval track is fast, but it's four left-hand turns. He's done all that. And so this year we dedicated ourselves to the Pikes Peak Hill Climb, which is a legal road up to the top of a 14,000 foot mountain. I think this is gonna be even more challenging than Indianapolis in that, you know, you've got to maintain the focus and the forward attention. In no way could we fail, even in the slightest degree. We knew that our margin of error was inches, feet, not tens of feet, twenties of feet for the hill climb. They'll have weather, altitude, sheer cliffs. You know, it's an intense race. And it's one of the most grueling challenges for both man and machine. We've done each iteration of the car each year in a matter of months. And then we drive. And every time we drive, we learn something new. We apply those lessons to the car, we iterate again, and then we keep driving. Definitely you need better uh, steering sensitivity for bike speed. It's crazy, but sometimes you gotta push the envelope and um, you know, see where the boundaries are. And I think we're not even close. This project is probably more me than, uh, than all the other things, you know. Uh, taking every opportunity, you know, se seizing every challenge and just, uh, you know, trying to accomplish what, what hasn't been done before. We never take a moment to, to recognize what we're doing. This is our first day on Pikes Peak, 
And Noel and I can tell you that three years ago, we never thought we were going to be here. And now we're going to drive the mountain. So have a good time, Sam. See you at the top. Thank you for the opportunity. You know, he might be injured and he, and he might be disabled, but he's still one of the best drivers in the world. With a little bit of help from technology, people with disabilities can do things that they never thought were possible before. the name Sam Schmidt. I feel inspired. Good job. All right. That's the way to get after it. Okay. A long left-hander. Take a guy that made his living driving cars and even after what happened to him stayed in the sport because you just can't get out no matter how hard you try. He's driving to the mountaintop. It's just a big beautiful view up there and I really want him to see it. Drive halfway. Perfect drive. Perfect line. That's awesome. Okay. The most frustrating part of the last 16 years is now being able to do simple things with my kids. When you get an opportunity like this, it's a lot of pride, it's a lot of emotion, and it sort of re-inspired me that anything's possible. And go like hell, go like hell, go, 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 go! Top of the world. I've seen that 500 times since last summer and it still gets me. He's such a great guy. And we, we do this, we do this for him and we do this for us, and yes, we, we, have, we have grown business from it, but the one thing that we haven't done is we have never protected the intellectual property on this project. This is a humanitarian project, and we want others to take the innovation and apply it in their own way for their own purposes. Maybe it's for a new wheelchair, a new generation of wheelchairs. Maybe it's for another vehicle for other types of disabled people. Maybe it's for something completely different that I can't even think about. Uh, but we're, we're ready to help them with that uh, because we know that it will, uh, it will help people and it will help us. So I only have a couple minutes left and I'm just gonna blitz through one more project. I encourage you to ask me about this uh, in, the, in the question and answers if you want to, because I won't be able to describe it fully. But I wanted to bring it up briefly now, simply because as successful as the SAMCAR project is, it's famous around the world. We have 1.8 billion media impressions on the SAMCAR project now. And that's for a company that you don't even know the name of, right? It's been fantastic. We tried the smart bike project this fall and I ended up canceling it, partly because the technology wasn't really working and partly because we didn't have a good coherent project with our partner. And so it's important to talk about your failures as well as your successes for those lessons learned. So the smart bike, very briefly, is a tandem bike. The rider on the back is both blind and paraplegic, so he can only pedal with his hands, yet he wanted to be competitive again. So we built him a bike to do that and an electronics platform, an IoT platform, that would allow him to communicate, to measure and understand his environment as well as his own performance. This is our, our smart bike rider, Mark Pollock, uh, a, a United Kingdom rowing champion who went blind from eye disease at the age of 22. Then he became a member of adventure team racing, raced in the Himalayas, raced to the South Pole even as a blind person, and then became paraplegic after a separate accident at the age of 34. Really tragic came to us and said, after six years of not competing, saying, can you help me back? I'd like, I think I can pedal a bike with my hands. We did one race in Northern Ireland. Uh, he did a 35 mile loop in three hours uh, with an average speed of 10 miles an hour. It was a great start. It all worked well enough. It was certainly not the Sam car, not yet. Uh, so what went wrong? And we can talk about this more, but a couple of things. Um, you know, he, we, 
we were really using only the data analytics for training purposes. We weren't able yet to really show them to the public. Um, we had a difference of opinion about what to do on a charitable basis. Um, Mark was reluctant to do public demonstrations, which, as you can see from the SAM car, become very important to us. But most of all, and this was the real philosophical difference, he wanted data analytics and sensors on the bike to help improve his athletic performance only, only. He did not want human to machine interface to help him take command of the bike, to steer the bike, and, uh, and to turn the bike, and to make the decisions about whether to pedal faster or slower. We were never going to propel the bike the way we do the car, but we wanted to give him human to machine command of the bike and he specifically did not want that. He felt that that was like using a performance-enhancing drug, and that to have him take command of the bike with the help of technology was a step that bordered on being unethical. And for that reason, we realized that we didn't have an agreement and we needed to stop. And with that, since I'm at my time limit, I hope you'll ask me about it. I'd like to talk about it some more. Uh, thank you very much.